Good morning, BFF. <laughs> Good morning, Alex. You're looking How very beautiful today. Thank you very much. So, I feel yeah, you always look beautiful. I've not, I've not <laughs> changed from our morning workout. <laughs> yeah, but you smashed the morning workout, didn't you? Don't it yeah. feel good, like, getting in that get fit class and then getting showered and ready and having, like, a full day before the day? Don't make me emotional, because, honestly, I don't know what's up with me this week. I keep, like, proper nearly crying. Like, you know when we probably did the workout want. this morning? <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> when we did the workout this morning, I was just watching us all, right, and then we were doing the warm-down stretches, and I just felt this overwhelming emotion for everybody <laughs> in the Zoom room, thinking... What a beautiful thing to do, like, getting <laughs> up, feeling really good about yourself. Like, honestly, at times, I would come in at half past six in the morning, and now we're getting up to do this workout, and it, like, sets you up for the day, like, with proper laugh, encourage each other, motivate, motivate each other. Like, we spend that time with people that you wouldn't normally spend time with and yeah. find so much in common and I know that sounds really dramatic for a morning workout right but that is how I felt this morning it was so beautiful Jeez, <laughs> oh my god she's getting like she's going soft in her old age you know what's um do you remember the other week when I had a twitchy lip oh so yeah I was on a live and I had a twitchy lip and it's gone I've never had it since but I've got a twitchy eye today which I know does mean That's tiredness tiredness right but my twitchy oh. eye it started today and then I thought like why am I tired and then I've just realized why I'm tired I've done seven weeks of NACOA volunteer training yeah <laughs> I've done moved my coaching at the same time I've been coaching in the support group on the evenings we're doing yeah. loads of podcasts we've just written da -da -da, you ready a brand new be sober fully accredited diploma worldwide so can, worldwide worldwide yes so that you can actually train to be a be sober coach and come on board with us it's no insurable. wonder we're tired and fully insurable yeah, yeah. fully insurable.com what to say <laughs> <laughs> but we've done a lot haven't we yeah so much there's so much going on there's so much more to come which is really exciting yeah we've got loads of um, exciting stuff lined up we've just got so, it, oh god life's so good right now which is so lovely to say like i don't want to feel like oh my god life's so good a bit smug about it right but sometimes my life has been so shit so i am going to feel a bit smug about it today is that all right like not smug. smug i'm not smug as in like oh my life's good and nobody ha, ha, has to you yes yeah, smug I mean, as in you've got it i mean like great I'm just grateful. Smug's the wrong word. What a horrible word that is. I'm never using that again. Please well, you don't, don't have to be that. smug, but I am. <laughs> so great. I'm just grateful. Really yeah, grateful. I am. And we've just recorded the most wonderful podcast. Like, neither of us really knew what to expect. It's Laura Cook Bolts and Tommy Bolts, the mother and son. And they've written a book called Unraveled, which we are definitely going to get reviewed in the book club. They yeah. are the loveliest people it wasn't it a really lovely podcast i nearly cried i i did I, it was just so it was so lovely and i think they did a really good job of not telling us all the juice even though i wanted the juicy bits for our podcast yeah but like it makes you really want to go and read like what really happened in the book but it was for me personally massively relatable um more than i'd, I'd I care to admit really. yeah <laughs> yeah massively relatable and I just think it's so brave and inspiring to see a mother and son both in recovery and sober hi Laura and Tom how are you both today good good thank you for having us we're really excited about this because it's the first time we've done we've done a, like four-way podcasts before but it's the first time we have ever done a podcast of this nature where it's mother and son two recovery journeys it's like we have no idea what to expect we've got a copy of the book but we're ready to start the book we've saved it as a big surprise we've been reading some reviews about the book which is unraveled and written by both of you from two perspectives it's so original like amazing well done <laughs> thank you thank you it yeah, was well, it was a piece of cake <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure <laughs> i'm not sure who we start with really i guess really your your story came out laura from what i can gather from the book because of dealing with tom's story that's where your kind of journey became more relevant again 
through Tom's story. And am I right in saying, Tom, that your journey starts at around the age of 13? Yeah, that's about right. I would say so. Yeah. And then, and then obviously, Laura, you'd previously battled with addiction yourself. So Correct. I, I'm not going to tell this story because honestly, I, I'm just going to hand it over. T tell us your story between you, whoever wants to go first. You go for it. Oh, would you like me to go first? Go for it. <laughs> or, oh, okay. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, all right. Where do I start? So I don't want to get too into depth about my family of origin, but I, I did grow up with an alcoholic mother who eventually ended up in recovery. And uh, she was an amazing woman. And uh, I always told myself, I will never be that person. I mean, I, wanted, I, I love my mother, but I will never be an alcoholic ever. I'm not going to do that. And uh, it just uh, goes to show you that you that one does not have control over this disease yeah. or demise. Um, and I was a uh, life of the party type person growing up. I partied. I had in college. Somehow I survived and made it through undergraduate in four years, and which was amazing considering how much fun I had. I still felt like. Um, Deep in my gut, I knew I didn't drink the same way everybody else drank. Yeah. But there's always that, that big piece of denial in there that allows you to keep going. Um, I'm going to fast forward because uh, this book is really not so much about my journey as an alcoholic, but more so about Tommy's and, and my um, involvement as a sober parent and what led to that and, and sort of um, what the solutions were. But I did live in New York City for, for three years, went to graduate school. I made it through that. I don't know how I did it. Um, I experimented with every drug known to man. I drank a lot. Dr uh, drinking alcohol was my drug of choice. Um, although I was in involved in a lot of cocaine use, I, I just, for me, it, it just, uh, it wasn't my favorite. Uh, after a time, and uh, I just stopped doing it. I, I was more uh, enamored with, with a bottle of wine or two. <laughs> so to fast forward, uh, I met my husband. Um, for some reason, I still enjoyed wine. It seemed like my, my active addiction was in somewhat of a dormant phase. I got married to my husband after, after dating him for a year and a half. I got married. I had children pretty right away. I had Tommy a year after I, I was married, after we were married. And I just, I didn't drink during my pregnancies. Not that I'm, that's, wow, aren't you amazing? It's just, it didn't appeal to me. I had three children very quickly. Um, and to, to fast forward, I think that by the time my youngest son, who was born six years later, um, after he was born, about two years after that, I really found myself sinking deep into my, my addiction. And by that, I mean, you know, I'd have bottles of wine open in the kitchen, bottles of wine open in the, in the bar area of our house. I, um, I didn't hide it, but yet that was my way of hiding it. I mean, I didn't hide the bottles. I just would start with one in the kitchen with dinner. I'd, I'd go to the one in the bar just so it would look like I didn't drink a whole bottle. Yeah, it's like hidden in plain sight, that, isn't it? Like, yeah. if they're all yes. open everywhere, I can just dip into any of them when I want to do. Exactly. And, oh, wasn't I so clever and nobody knew? That was pretty <laughs> clever, actually, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. So um, I just I just knew, you know, in an evening before we, my husband and I would go out, I would have trouble looking at myself in the mirror. I would see myself and I'd have to have this conversation. Don't drink too much tonight. Don't drink too much tonight. And inevitably, if, if I had a drink, it wasn't one. It was more like five or six. Um, ultimately, I was buzzed. And, and that pattern um, just increased. It just increased. And so I think that was in about 2002. In 2008, I got sober. So um, for me, um, there was just kind of an emptiness. There was uh, a little bit of um, a lot of dysfunction in my family growing up. Yeah. And I, I'm sure 
there were many reasons why I drank, um, but I think to fill a void, a hole, an emptiness, a loneliness, something I never really resolved, even after years and years of therapy from growing up in a, a family with alcoholics, um, it's very difficult to get psychological help when you're an active drinker. That yeah. doesn't work. I, I mean, to the degree that I was drinking. And it wasn't until I got sober that I really started doing the work I needed to do. Um, and, you know, alcoholism is such a terrible thing because I look at my children. I look at my husband, who's an amazing man. I love my children so much. Yet that, I, I, why, why would I continue on this, this pattern of destruction? It's, I could not control it. It controlled me. And um, it, it was just a very, very sick uh, headspace to be in. And uh, I didn't want to be that person. I never wanted to be that person. I wanted to be um, at peace. I didn't want to be so conflicted. Um, on the outside, I probably looked pretty good during the day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, you have a perfect house. But, you know, it always had to be tidy and clean because I could control that. My kids were tidy and clean and aren't they perfect children? And, and, um, you know, Can I, I just say, I love that. Tom's face right now. Look, he's sat there thinking, yeah, I was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it just was, it was, it, that's a, that's sort of a, um, a, just a basic story that I have, but there are um, things that happened um, even in my sobriety where I, I had to learn to let go of control and um, things always needing to be perfect. So I would look perfect. And one of my favorite stories with Tommy and I was sober, I'm pretty sure. Um, I, he and I were in a, in, in a discussion. I was upset with him for something and I got, I, I left the house to go run an errand and I came back and he had rearranged furniture, pulled drawers out, moved all my perfect arrangement on top, tops of dressers. And I got home and I started to get mad at him for doing that. And I actually had this reality check that, oh my God, I'm such a control freak. I really need to do some more work. And, and I got to understand what that all means. Um, but he was, he was a very clever kid. In terms of Tommy, he was just born into this world a happy guy. He was one of those babies that laughed a lot and he was a little stinker when he could walk and he was fun and funny and we laughed together i mean we just um he was a great great little little boy um so when he when he started experiencing problems in um elementary school with bullying it it broke his heart but it broke my heart oh it's broke mine that, now i've just got like little goosebumps that's so sad so that that he can tell his own story but that was the beginning i think of some um you know trauma has many forms that was the beginning of some pretty serious trauma i mean he was physically uh abused and emotionally abused in a catholic boy school and um my husband and I did the right thing. Eventually we took him out and, and all these details are in the, in the book, but I think, um, you know, Tommy can speak to what that did for him emotionally and, and, um, how that may have led him into other things in his life that were destructive. But, um, the journey of getting sober for me, I, I the bottom line on 2008 was I had a car accident the night prior to never drinking again. And when I woke up and the car was totaled in my driveway and I, I really couldn't remember who drove my car, I thought, which kid took my car out for a joyride? You know, and I, and I said, oh my God, eventually it sort of came back to me. I crashed my car. And in and, and my car, there's something called OnStar where they talk to you and they say, oh, Mrs. Bolt, are you okay? And I thought, uh, that's so they can send you help. They got an activated uh, message when your airbag employs. And I, I, uh, I said, oh, God, no, because certainly I'll go to jail because I had had too much to drink. So I said, no, I'm fine. And I remember driving the car home. Um, I can't tell you exactly where the accident was. Aww. They gave me a longitude and a latitude but I, when I asked them. But I, I really don't remember the act of the accident so much as I remember... Um, 
you know, just kind of awakening to this big, huge bag over my face, this airbag, and somehow getting my car home um, and parking it in the driveway. So the next morning when I saw the car, I honest to God, I thought, I'm in so much trouble. Did I kill somebody? What is it going to take for me to stop drinking? I have a family. I have people that, that care about me that I love. I could have killed someone and uh, thank God I didn't. And thank God I, I didn't kill myself. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, it was, um, it was a true epiphany for me. I really felt like my, you know, you can call it whatever you want. God, your higher power was talking to me and in, in loving kindness and just saying, this is, this is enough. You know, you can do this. And, um, somehow the fear of not drinking anymore lifted. Um, when you contemplate stopping drinking, you're, you're fearful of many things. What's my life going to be? Who are my friends going to be? Am I going to be fun? Um, yeah. Am I going to be embarrassed? Because now all of a sudden the cat's out of the bag when I quit drinking. They're going, oh, you quit drinking. Why did you quit drinking? Well, what a joke. I mean, it's like somebody asking me early on in sobriety, how are you doing? And I thought, geez, why didn't you ask me that like a year ago when I was drunk off my ass? <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> so um, it was a huge relief to me. And I haven't had a drink um, since that time. And then I entered almost immediately within a day or two, a program of recovery. That's wow. amazing. And, and I, I can't say that it was me um, that did that. I really feel like there was divine intervention and I heard it. Yeah, I was ready to hear it. And I, I, you know, I was caught. I, um, and my husband during this process was very loving and kind. He um, realized there was a problem. He grew up in a family um, where it was a, a conversation. His father was in, um, uh, started a rehab facility in St. Louis, Missouri with a couple of other partners. And so that was not an unfamiliar disease, demise mm -hmm. to him. And he was gentle and kind. And that was, wow, that, that really, it helped me a lot. And it also really made me more introspective um, because there was a time when he brought out my drinking to me. And um, that really hit me. It was about six months before I, I quit drinking. And he just said to me, do you think the the effects of alcohol are, are hitting you harder? Do you feel like you're drinking more? He said, I'm just really worried. And I sobbed and sobbed because he was so right. And of course I had to go out and do six more months of dangerous field work. Yeah. yeah. Because, you field know, work, that, I love that. <laughs> I, I mean, that loving kindness was not enough for me to stop. I mean, what a crazy mind in my addicted mind I was. And, um, but here I am today, and I, I was so grateful and am so grateful that I, I was sober when Tommy was going through um, a lot of his own um, issues. And um, it, and I just, uh, I wanted to be there for him in the healthiest way that I could. We had a lot of chaos going on at the time. Uh, Tommy was making dinner for the kids. My mother was in a care facility with dementia, and my stepfather was living with me uh, not bedridden, but, but deathly ill. Yeah. And, um, he lived with us for a year and a half, which I'm so, so happy about. Um, and my kids learned what it was like to take care of each other, but this was right at the time when Tommy was getting into his deep addiction. I, I don't know which way was right, which way was left. Sick mom, sick, sick dad, yeah. um, a son that needed me, um, that needed, needed more direction. Um, three other kids that sort of raised themselves at some point, you know, I just kind of had to put them over to the side and just really hone in on Tommy, which is not yeah. always the answer. Okay. Um, and I needed help during that time. So I sought help from an amazing therapist to help me be the best parent I could be for Tommy and also take care of me, which resulted in, in a better situation for the family. In the middle of all that, um, I had a stepmother who um, committed suicide, oh. took her life. And so we we all as a family really worked together. And, and Tommy made a lot of contributions 
to helping out. As I said, he would make everybody dinner, you know, but little did I know at the time he was high as a kite. And, uh, and here we are today, both in recovery, and we can share this with people. The main objective of writing our book, Unraveled, um, is that we can share our experience. Um, it's mostly Tommy's story. I'm sort of a supporting actress in it. Um, but to show that, that I always feel that if I could get sober, anybody could get sober. And I think yeah. Tommy says, says the same thing in the book. So his story is one of great courage and uh, there is hope, there is a solution and there are people there, we're out there to help whoever we can um, because we understand it. And, and I understand it being um, the child of an alcoholic, the mother of an addict and yeah. one myself. It's multidimensional. Um, it usually is, isn't it? I mean, like trauma runs in families, addiction can run in families. You know, I, I come from a similar sort of background, which our, our listeners know that my father was self-proclaimed alcoholic, but an amazing man. And I had the same thing as you. I will never be that bad. I will never be that drinker. I will never get to that point. You know, it's it's there, there's, there's quite a, a lot of parallels there. I did become not as bad, different a different type of drinker through different reasons. And I guess that's, do you remember 2008 clearly, tell me then? Do you remember, I called you Tommy then, Tom. Oh, you do, Tom. I just want to say thank you so much, Laura, for that. So honest. I'm really anxious about listening to you, Tom, and what you've got to say in a minute, because this story is so much more relatable than I ever imagined. And it's already making me really emotional. Um, for myself, one of the big reasons I stopped drinking was for my youngest child, um, who was 13, who was going for, through a really, really bad time. And at the same time as that, I had um, my son was going through an equally bad time. And when you were saying you didn't know whether who to focus on or... Um, so I'm just dead anxious to talk to you. I'm really looking forward to it, but I'm really worried I might cry. So um, <laughs> it don't matter if you cry. Go. Let's do it. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I want to make sure that I don't give too much away of the, of the book. But, yeah. Um, you know, I would say, uh, you know, I had a good, a really good childhood in, um, until that point and I had friends really good friends um, that I've been going to school with for years and it was time for me to to move on to another school and when that happened that's when the the bullying um, started and I don't didn't know what I was doing wrong I thought I was you know I was being the same guy that I was or the same you know boy that I was before and I didn't understand why um, I was getting, um, you know, chosen to be that guy, you know? Um, so it was really tough, you know, it was, uh, I tried my best to make friends. It just wasn't working. And, um, I would have a really hard time on Sunday nights. Um, you know, Friday would roll around. I'd be out of school and the weekend would be like my, like relaxation time where I could just like not worry about any of that at all and just be myself. And Sunday would roll around and <clears throat> I would just be terrified to go to school the next morning. Like I just wanted to fake sick or, or not go. And um, there are a lot of times when my mom had to come to my room and just sit with me until I fell asleep. Um, you know, there was one time that was really bad. You'll read about this in the book um, where I was just in pretty bad shape um, on a Sunday night and she ended up giving me a, um, I don't know what it was. I'm, it was a, a Valium and yes, <clears throat> I didn't have any, Fears, it did what it was supposed to do, you know, and I fell asleep and woke up the next morning and went to school, but that comes into play later on. Um, but I think I, I, you know, it was, 
the bullying started to get a little bit worse. It started to get physical. Um, you know, I started to get shoved into to lockers and stuff. And I don't think that that's, you know, um, any reason why I started, you know, drinking or, or using drugs. You know, I don't think that that's the, the cause of it. Um, but I, it got to the point where I ended up switching schools and I found a group of people who I like to hang out with there, like almost instantly. And um, when it came to be the point in time when people were experiencing with alcohol and, and drugs, and I was in, and I was in that group that we like to do that stuff a lot. Yeah. Started doing it a lot. Um, at first, there weren't any consequences. Um, it was fun. It was on the weekends. It was uh, with friends. Once I started to get into, um, I think it was probably the transition from middle school to high school. So eighth grade and to, to ninth grade that summer, um, I started smoking a lot of weed and um, doing a lot of drinking. So it started kick, it, it sort of kicked off there um, to an extent. Um, I was on the tennis team. I got kicked off the tennis team um, because I wanted to leave and smoke weed. <laughs> I was, uh, you know, I, I finished my tennis match. And I was like, well, I don't have to wait here for everybody else to finish. I'm just going to go do my thing. And <clears throat> the coach didn't like that too much. Um, so he asked me to <laughs> leave the team, and I think he asked me to come back a couple days later. But I was like, oh, I'm done. I don't even want to play anymore. Um, you know, I, I, that was, you know, that period of time was probably like the first time when I thought maybe there wasn't something wrong with me. You know, before it was like, like, oh, there's something wrong with me. Like, I'm not like other kids. <clears throat> I feel like I'm like a step behind. Like, I'm always getting the jokes last or I'm always, you know, yeah. figuring stuff out last. Um so at this point in my life in, in high school, I didn't really feel like that. I felt like I was, you know, on top of everything. And <clears throat> in that case, and... Um, it helps you feel like you fit, I think, at that age. I can relate to that. I always felt like I didn't really fit in. And the drinking and smoking weed with my mates, it, it gives you that kind of... It's like a comfort blanket, isn't it? Like... Yeah. You suddenly like in this place where you're all on the same page and you're like yeah exactly exactly we're all coming together doing the same thing yeah you know this is what this is what life is <laughs> you know they were last and, night, but at the time that is it you do think this is what life is this is yeah. it i've made it <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly i had that feeling a couple times in, in, in my in my using career um but yeah, I, I, once that the tennis team stuff happened and I started skipping class, I started experimenting with other drugs. Um, I barely made it to graduation. I mean, I, I had to go to an alternative school um, to catch up and um, graduate with my class. And I started getting in a lot of fights. Um, it started at... at um, at parties normally yeah. um i got in a couple at school um i'd say after graduation of high school it just everything just took off i mean it was like free reign um started doing getting into you know cocaine and and xanax and painkillers and painkillers were terrible at the moment, I loved them, you know, because that, those were the, I'd say those were what really made me um, not feel how I didn't want to feel. And it's really filling me with like a lot of sadness hearing you because people don't relate the fact that painkillers take away physical pain. But actually that feeling of drifting off with a painkiller it's going to blot out all that emotional pain as well. And it's just, I can really feel it from you. I can, it's, it, it's strange how much I can feel that from you. 
Yeah, it's he was blotting out pain. Yes. I was just taking it, taking it all away, wherever it was coming from. I didn't really have the knowledge or the want to figure out exactly what it was. So I just was covering it up and um, it did its job. You know, alcohol did the same thing for me, Mm -hmm. but I didn't necessarily want to look like an alcoholic. I didn't want to have, you know, I didn't want to drink all day long. You know, (laughs) why not? Yeah. Like, I don't want to look like I don't want to look like I have a problem here. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so that was like my go-to. You know, alcohol was like the nights and the weekends and stuff like that. Um, but at this point, it was like an everyday, you know, it was every day, all day occurrence. I had to be on something. Um, otherwise, I was, you know not not loving life at all (laughs) and um you know some more serious things started to happen i i uh wrecked my car i um i was arrested uh you know i i totaled my motorcycle and ended up in the emergency room and uh that was kind of a uh a kick in the butt. I, it, it was it. It was weird. It was. Um, I ended up in there, and for some reason, I just blurted out to. I, I can't remember. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Laura. But it was one of the doctors there that knew Grandpa and knew that he had started that facility, and she was asking me. Um, you know, give me a reason why I shouldn't hold you here, you know, because you were high and wrecked your motorcycle. And I said, and I'm, I meant it too. And I I said, I'm done with that stuff. Like I'm, I'm done with it. I learned my lesson and I'm pretty sure the very next day I was like abusing my pain meds from the crash. Like it was like, you know, like I, I, I meant it, but then like there was no solution. And so I ended up going back and I went back and forth and did that a bunch of times. My mom would help me detox on the couch, uh, outside and I'd last maybe three days, uh, maybe a week, um, and end up back again and worse. And, um, I think a couple times we brought up that she wanted to send me to uh, a treatment center. And I said, no, 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 I got this on my own. And um, I tried every which way on, on my own. And it got to the point where it was like, it, I, I had a, a bad, a really bad night on Halloween night. Um, I had had worse probably. Um, but for some reason, this was like, this was, this is what really kicked it, kicked it off. And, um, I went through, it's in, it's pretty descriptive in the book, but I, I, I got into a couple fights and ended up, uh, doing some stupid things and, uh, woke up the next morning and my hand was broken again. I did that a couple of times. I was missing, uh, part of my, uh, front tooth. Oh gosh. And, um, I was just like, I, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Like I, I had given up kind of, and I think I, I pretty much surrendered like right there. And, um, I told my mom that I needed help and I was willing to do anything. And, uh, so she said, okay, here's a couple of numbers to call you, figure it out. And, and so I did, and I went the treatment maybe five days later that was rough because i wanted to be done and i wanted help now and they said um we don't have a bed for like five days and i'm like oh no (laughs) so i have to like keep using for five days even though i don't want to because i don't want to get sick yeah yeah and so like i did 
like a little bit like it's like so I just didn't get sick it was miserable Gosh, yeah. and uh and and then I went to detox and and got clean and my second journey started <laughs> It does, doesn't it? That's just like the, it's like the very beginning, yes. isn't it? Stopping is the beginning. The journey comes after, doesn't it? When you actually mentally start to evolve. Yeah, it comes after. And it was uh, a lot harder than I expected, but <laughs> um, a lot more fulfilling. And uh, I definitely am grateful for it every day. Um, it's something that, you know, is just like, uh, my drug use, you know, I got to do it every day. <laughs> you, you know, can I you just know. ask, sorry, Laura, how did you feel at that point? Like when he said that is enough in your, as a parent now, when you've helped him detox them few times before, did you know it was going to be different this time? Or was it like, like what, what did you do? Cause I, it's just so hard, isn't it? <laughs> it's so hard. I just, he was teaching tennis at the time. So I, I love that you it, went back to tennis. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, he, was, he or he worked at a tennis facility, and he um, was going to community college, but not really. But not really. Okay. But anyway, I, I, I knocked on his door the day after Halloween, which, by the way, both of us had our last drunks in hurrahs on Halloween. Wow. <laughs> which is really weird okay halloween's a weird thing anyway um i'm pretty sure you crashed your car and i crashed my motorcycle in the that's same. right yes i'm pretty sure we, uh, well, yeah, you, I so. stay in on halloween, you oh, stay halloween in. Is, You're bummed. i was always dressed up as a witch <laughs> but anyway let me let me get to the point here so i i went in his room that morning and i said wow i said don't you have to go to work and he kind of rolled over and he was sort of bloody and just, oh gosh. And I said, God, what does the other guy look like? You know, I thought maybe, you know, he, he did. And you can read about it in the story. He had gotten himself into a, a, a tussle. And I said, why don't you um, take a shower and come on downstairs? And in my gut, I knew that he had hit a, a un, you know, an uncertain bottom, but it was certain. And I called my husband. I said, come home from work. The iron is hot. I mean, I really felt like this is going to be the time that something's going to affect him where he is really going to want to do something himself. And he came downstairs. And at that point, Tom was, who's my husband, who's also named Tom, um, was in the kitchen. And he said, what is dad doing here? And I said, um, I'm scared. And my husband said, I'm scared. I'm afraid, Tom. I'm, we're both afraid. And I think that's when he's, I think he made, did you feel relief, Tommy, a little bit? I mean, the cat was so out of the bag. And we had yeah, tried. It was, it was over. It was over. It, and we knew it. And I, I oh, also knew that. I know it's making me emotional. <laughs> I just want to hug you both. You just like, you can feel, honestly, across this screen. I can feel how much love and respect you have for each other. It's just amazing. You've got an amazing bond. You can feel it. Oh, I'm so glad because I believe we do. And I think it gets better all the time. And, and we have sobriety <laughs> to thank for that. And that's really all either of us wanted anyway, our bonds with people that we love and especially our children, my children and my husband. And, and um, it's so important. Um, and to watch... I mean, I went through it myself, but to watch your son, my son, my baby, that little boy, my firstborn, go through so much struggle and see that drugs caused um, an, an escape, well, that was an effect, but also caused um, him to lose his passion. He was a good athlete. He was an amazing little snowboarder, um, and he just really lost interest in all the things that he loved and his love became drugs and that's what happened happens to all of us that are in addiction and um and that was really hard to see that was really tough to see um and for him obviously tough to live through and love and difficult to be um and you know the book will reveal and tommy can 
can tell you too that he did end up in sobriety getting back into snowboarding which he loved and he be, he oh, was a racer God. and a national national champion and and did world alpines all over europe and he is amazing um he got his life back the life that he was always meant to have he got it back and it was through his his hard work and uh and we did we supported him in sobriety there was a point you know when you have your kids living with you and and, and allegedly going to college and <laughs> and working um that uh you don't want to enable the behavior and and that is a big thing the codependency because we want to protect our kids so much and we want to solve their problems we just want to take care of it for them make it go away i couldn't make it go away i i just couldn't make it go away and um i couldn't i couldn't do it for them well, i mean there were did you do, Laura? You know, b before we'd made this decision to get sober, how how did you deal with that when you knew he was like going out and taking drugs and drinking and all these things? How did you kind of not enable it? Um, well, I think I did enable it because yeah. I I would have these nagging conversations with him. I would go in his room and and look for things like I found pills and I'd find you know handles of liquor and. Things like that, and those were so all. Mad. I was so mad when you. Yeah, she have been and got that. them. Yeah. Come, come I'd home after a long night. Down the yeah, sorry, Tom. Go ahead. I'd come home after a long night just to find the drawer empty. Oh, <laughs> like, oh. It was oh, to no. me. I did thought I was doing the right thing, but I yeah. instead I was really contributing to the behavior because I wasn't defining the boundaries. Yeah. You know, I mean, you could say, if you do that again, I mean, wh then what? And, yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> and that is it. What is the then what anyway? Yeah. You know, I, there, what, what do you think you should have done? Um, I think you did exactly what I think you did exactly what you should have done. I think he's, you didn't couldn't have done any more. I mean, look, he's sat here sober. He's living his best life right. and he's followed your example. I think I think you're amazing as a mother and son. Well, I think that I did the very best I could yeah. with trying to, at the time, trying to, what I thought was help him. And yeah. fortunately, being sober, I had the right guidance from a therapist to understand their times to stand back. But to ask, answer your question, um, I will tell you that that I had very many sleepless nights. There are a lot of times, if, if not many, many times, that I didn't think Tommy was going out. I thought it, he was just staying home and having friends over and a lot of times i'd fall asleep and he would go out if i fell asleep but i didn't hear him he would go out at midnight he would leave the house to go out yeah. and so i found out a lot i mean i'm not naive but i was naive about some things because well it was more more of a blind eye a choice of you know turning a blind eye to it because i'm like he couldn't possibly be putting his life at risk till three and four in the morning well that's exactly what he was doing <laughs> Yeah. So I had a lot of unrest. There was a lot of, and, and how did I maintain my sobriety? I had to, if I hadn't maintained my sobriety, our family, you know, me, it, it just, it, it just, it wouldn't have helped Tommy. It wouldn't have helped me. And um, I just stayed committed to my program of recovery. And, and that was really important. And my husband's a very religious person. He's very private about it. But uh, for him, his solution was to pray, go to church, and 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 those solu are solutions. And uh, it just it was heartbreaking. I, I had three other we have three other children that needed my attention. I had you know he has a younger brother that's nine years younger than he is, and um, they all witnessed yeah. everything that was going on, and they they took it all in. And um, I think based on on especially Tommy's accident, they, they said, that's it. If I've ever smoked weed or if I've ever done anything, that is no longer going to be in my, you know, in my world. And, and, and it isn't for, for any of them. Oh, um, so they learned a great deal. Well done. From taught the rest yeah. of them. <laughs> you, just thought you taught the rest of them a good lesson. But, you know, we say this to our members quite a lot, that no matter how, and I'm speaking to you really here, Laura, 
book guest both of you no matter how tough life gets and, and it will have been majorly tough for you at least at one big point where you're getting sober or remaining sober you're trying to help tom alcohol will never ever make anything better in the long run it's like and we say this all the time yeah you're just a you're perfect dual example of that that at any one time no doubt one of you or both of you could have given in and said this is too hard but it's just absolutely not worth it and every, with everything that you go through, because life happens, whether somebody close to you dies or somebody's sick or, you know, so many things are out of your control in life. And if not most everything. And, um, you know, if, I, if you can get through the first challenge and you realize, wow, I absolutely got into a solution and I feel so much better because I stayed sober. I mean, all hell breaks loose if you were to go back and use again. Your life would be 10 times worse than the way you remembered it using because it's a, a progressive fatal disease. It's a disease of more. And by the time you, you one can relapse, it's only a question of a few weeks before you're in it thicker than you've ever been and heavier than you've ever been before. And we know this. I also know that as a... Um, recovering alcoholic in the beginning there are times I would romanticize about yeah. drinking oh look you know you go to Paris or you go to a city and people are sitting in cafes drinking and smoking I'm like oh that cigarette looks so good oh a glass of wine looks so good and you romanticize that those times that you were drinking were elegant well they weren't they were trash they were terrible but you take it I took it full circle somebody taught me that a long time ago you take it full circle and you think um, in a span of 30 seconds, I can make that picture look like a car accident. I could make it look like my kids don't talk to me anymore. My husband wants to leave me. I could make it because that's exactly what would happen. Play it forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, yeah, and so agree. that's enough to scare me. And, and being afraid of that is okay. Um, I just, and then uh, with Tommy, you know, I just, I, I just, I pray myself. I pray for myself. I pray for my children. I, but I think his journey, um, getting sober and staying sober and what he's done in his life since then is an act of huge courage. Getting sober at 21 years old and staying sober yeah. is far different from being 48. Now I'm 61. Yeah. It's far different. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. But you've got a long life ahead of you, at least. And can I just ask, sorry, look, oh, Lisa, asking. you can, I want to ask about the painkillers and it'll go off no, topic. That's, hold on. No, you'll have to wait, I'm sorry, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to ask is because there was like a number of different things that you kind of take, and did you just stop everything at once? Was there anything in particular that you struggled with most? In terms of what I used? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I... I would say I used three main things all the time. It would be, um, well, I'd say two for certain, uh, cocaine and, uh, and painkillers. And when I could get them, um, any kind of, of Xanax or Valium or anything like that. Um, but I loved to mix the cocaine and, and the painkillers. Yeah. Um, in like the beginning of the day, I would do like just painkillers, and then afterwards, I would, I would start mixing them. Um, so that was my, <laughs> that was my get down. Um, but when I, you know, I I stopped it all at, at once. When I got when wow. I got clean, it was all of it. I didn't it do I didn't do any question. suboxone or or any of that. I didn't do any of like the stuff that you wean off of. Yeah. Uh, I just it's interesting because a lot of people like sometimes go in maybe rehab to come off say cocaine or alcohol but then continue to smoke weed oh yeah yeah no i'm <laughs> yeah so it's all it's all gone, all gone. It, it is relevant then now the, the question that i was going to ask kind of but i still want to ask it if that's all right and, and tell me to mind my own business if it's too much <laughs> is it <laughs> like Obviously, taking painkillers is something that's, you know, happened through life. If you have an accident, you're going to need to take, potentially need to take something or whatever. Is mm -hmm. that something now that keeps you at high risk that you have to just accept that 
I have n can never have these things. And I guess what you said earlier about the value, and that's kind of like, ah, this knocks me out. This takes away any worry. That's kind of where yeah. the trigger was, yeah? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, my friends, some of my friends call me uh, crazy Tom for uh, the way I handle that. Um, those situations that you're talking about because um, I have been um, hospitalized. I mean, I've been in the ER, um, I've had surgeries um, and I just don't do it. I just don't take the pain meds. Oh my God, because you're high risk sport as well. That's what made me think. Yeah, that, if you're a snowboarder and you ride a motorcycle, at some point you're going to get a cut knee. <laughs> at least. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I had, um, I don't know if, if, if you guys have experienced this, but uh, I had a couple of kidney stones uh, oh. <clears throat> and didn't, I was refusing to, to take anything in the ER, in the emergency room, and they called me crazy, but I was like, I just can't, oh, think, you know, can't do it. I've had um, a couple surgeries and just refused it, and um, it's definitely not fun. You know, but, um, you know, they they give me a high dose of, of Tylenol or whatever it is that, what, whatever it is that they can give me. Um, and yeah, it, it sucks in the moment. It's really brutal and, um, it's not fun at all. I usually can't talk to anybody when I'm in that, yeah. that much pain. Just leave me alone and let me just. Yeah, I get that. I'd be like that. Um, but I'm terrified of going back to that place again i just can't can't do it and you, and you both had that in common you know you both said we're afraid of ever going back. it's kind of a healthy fear because it keeps you held in the present and it mm -hmm. keeps you held in the on the right side of things i honestly think you're incredible both of you i think you've got an amazing relationship <laughs> i think you've got an incredible story i can't wait to get stuck into the book which i do have a copy of i'm and scared of reading it i'm not it, I, felt... like I am and i am I just don't know whether it might be too relatable and too like triggering. <laughs> I felt the I, I can you know I felt really emotional at times there, and we've only heard I suspect the tip of the iceberg there. There's a lot yeah. more detail in the book, and I I've read some of the reviews, so I know there's more detail in the book because <laughs> the reviews are amazing. Um, yeah, I, I, I've not, I can't even tell you what I want to say. I just think you're incredible, <laughs> both of you. It's amazing. There's some good. There's some good reviews. There's also some pretty bad reviews too. Oh, there's some. Oh, we don't worry about think, them. We don't worry about an, them. You know, I you've made it when you've got bad reviews. That's what we always say. As soon as we start getting trolled, we've made it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was reading them. You go ahead, Tom. I was reading. I went through actually recently, and I started reading all the reviews on uh, one of the websites, and I started reading just the bad ones, <laughs> and. I, of course, I'm not going to read the good ones. I just want to see what the, what the mean people have to say. <laughs> um, and I thought to myself, I said, man, I said, wouldn't it be just so hard to be in that in fame? Yeah. Be yeah. famous. You, know, you walk out of your door and you forget to do your hair or something. And instantly you're on social media getting lit up. And I just, you know. So it's scary. also incredibly hard to be a troll and somebody who's mean about somebody else. I'd be really tempted to say, can I read your book, please, that you haven't written before you criticize <laughs> well, mine? <laughs> then to your point, the first few reviews I had, which were obviously written by very young people. I mean, you can you can see their profiles, all right? So I know they're very, very young people. <laughs> and uh, we and they have their, they have their not, not that I have anything against young people because there are a lot of good reviews from young people. But uh, the kinds of things that they said, some of them were actually very mean. Yeah. And I, I said, you know, look, this book is not for everybody. It really yeah. isn't. But if, uh, and it's not a perfect book. All that we did was share our experience, our strength, our hope, uh, information about a relationship, um, we, you know, we didn't have a thousand page book where we could go into depth about absolutely every aspect of our addiction in life. But I think it's a, it's a general story about what we, what we went through. And I think, you know, it took us three years to write the book. And uh, the, first, the first book that we had, it got to about four chapters. I, I, I hated it. 
I, I thought it was the worst <laughs> damn thing I'd ever read. It was terrible. It was so flowery and full of shit. And I, I finally said to Tommy, we, we're we starting, we're tearing up, start over. So we started <laughs> over. So that's and what you could say to your trolls, like, you should have read the last one if you could. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Why don't you why don't you think about those clever things at the moment? God, I'm gonna use that. So I think that readers readers want to know more about my my addiction. It, it it was not easy getting sober, but it comes to a point, at least for me, and I think for Tommy, when enough is enough and you you see that little glimmer of hope and light and um, and and the opportunity is there. And if you're ready and it's scary. You you go for it. Yeah. You just go for it because life is so much better on the other side. It is so much better. It really and is, isn't it? Proof of that. It's just it, amazing. We said your relationship. Well, yeah, yeah. I we're, just, we're, it's so inspiring to see. And for me, as a mother of three teenagers, um, oh. it's more inspiring than I can can you say on here. <laughs> And yeah. I'm like yeah. you, I've got two two teenagers and one at 10 years younger than the eldest one. So so three as well. And I, I'm kind of thinking, oh, you know, you can see certain traits through, they must have seen what I was like. Lisa's kids must have seen what she was like. You know what I mean? You, you, it's that element of guilt no matter what you do. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. And it's, yeah. It's self-inflicted and it doesn't do anything. You, you can't. I mean, you can't change it. You can't go back and undo it. All you can do is make the best of what you've got, lead by example, which you've done an incredible job of, and support as best you can. But you know what I think we should do, Lisa? We should get the book unraveled on our book club with Alex. Oh yeah, definitely. That's what oh, we'll do. I love it. We'll That's do what we will that. do. We will ask. We will ask our book club leader to read your book in yeah. the June book club if she's not got one lined up definitely this year as well now isn't it so, it is on yeah. audible yeah Laura's yeah, camera's we'll definitely camera. do that and um, Tom before we go what would you say to somebody um that was in your position a few years ago before getting sober if somebody come to you and was like I've had enough of this shit yeah. I feel okay. a bit rubbish what what would your advice be well, if they came to me and, and they said, I've had enough for this, I'd say, well, um, I'll tell you exactly what, what, what I did. Yeah. So I'll tell you exactly what I did and what's been working for me. I'd say if, and give them a little bit of my story and say, if you can relate to any of that and think that that might work for you, then give it, then, then we should, you know, give that a shot. But it's, it's hard. It's, it's hard to talk to somebody that's currently struggling I mean, it's not hard to talk to them. It's easy. I can talk to anybody, but um, if they're anything like me, I had to get to the point to where it was so bad that I had to make that decision myself and say, Nobody I need help. Said anything. Yeah. You know? And I think that's one of the things that I was going to say to, to Laura earlier is that I'm so grateful that she didn't step in and force me to do something earlier um, because I don't know if I would have gotten to the point um, and to the lows that I did and able to, to make that decision because I see a lot of a lot of people that um, that happens to and they're in and out and in and out and in and out and um, I'm, I was I'm grateful for that so well you yeah. were ready you were ready. <laughs> Thing, right? Sounds like he was born ready. He's like, you know what? Make fill me with a load of joy before I keep. I've got this phrase at the moment, filling me with joy. But what really filled me with joy was when you said, like, he was born happy, and now he's living the life he was meant to live. Oh, I just like, I just want to hug. I want to hug you both. It's just oh, you're, give you a hug. Give a hug. hug. You're amazing. <laughs> you are amazing. Will you hang on at the very end because we've just like two minutes with you after we finish recording? Oh, sure, certainly, right. certainly. But thank you both of you. Honestly, thanks. it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for coming on, both of you. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much. much. We'll put all the links as well to your book on the bio of this podcast. That sounds Perfect. great. Thank you. We appreciate it. Bye. Bye-bye.